Ernie, I'd like to go back and, and amplify some of our discussion about varieties of recovery experience. Could you talk a little bit about how those varieties increased as they went from Akron to New York to Cleveland and beyond? Well, I think that explosion after the war especially, that's one thing that helps me date it, because even within the city of Cleveland, they're, they're, it's the first real explosion. New York AA started really in either Brooklyn or upper New Jersey. Uh, right. We call New York AA, but uh, uh, Cleveland, there's a pamphlet that they published in Cleveland in, in 1946 that on AA in Cleveland, it's called. And uh, let me read you two paragraphs from, from it. Okay. AA groups are fundamentally little bands of people who are friends who help, can help each other to stay sober. Each group, therefore, reflects the needs of its own members. The way a group is managed is the way its members want it to be managed for their common benefit. As a result, we have large groups, small groups, groups which have refreshments, groups which never have refreshments, groups which like long meetings, groups which like short meetings, social groups, working groups, men's groups, women's groups, groups that play cards, groups which specialize in young people, and as many other varieties as there are kinds of people. Each group has its own customs, its own financial problems, and its own method of operation. As long as it follows as a group the same principles AA recommends for individuals, unselfishness, honesty, decency, and tolerance, it is above criticism. And you no, know, this, this. That's beautiful. It, yeah. It's just this wide variety. And this is just one metropolitan Tell me again the date that was held. 1946. 46. AA in, in Cleveland, right. 1946. It's just amazing to me that, uh, you know, this in. This short time this happened, I speak earlier of having clan groups of have clan bags of various social activities right. probably, but this uh, and as it spread around the country, this is just true in so many ways. I mean there were groups that you wanted more of the spiritual, for example, and so perhaps would say a prayer or two at the beginning of the end. There were groups that didn't want any of that God stuff and yeah. they might say the serenity prayer, they might just open and close. And, mm -hmm. and every except you know, the basic every member had a desire to stop drinking. Everything else was up to the members of the group. Yeah. And the other thing, group conscience, when they had it, there wasn't usually a regular group conscience meeting scheduled, although some groups scheduled regular group. Somebody wanted a group conscience yeah. meeting, they'd have one. It wasn't such a simple majority vote. They always would try almost the old Quaker uh, principle of, mm -hmm. you know, to find a, a, a something with which everyone could be happy, so no one would feel they'd been voted down. Again, some groups did have right. votes. You cannot generalize about this at all, but the general tendency had, was always in this direction, and uh, I just think it's an amazing part of the age longevity. Yeah. In, the, in the last decade, you've, you've been approached by Faces and Voices of Recovery to do a special project on pulling together this modern diversity even beyond AA, yeah. you know, and that's also part of the variety story, isn't it? I think it is. It's interesting from the very beginning, uh, even before they lost the copyright. Uh, if anyone wanted to use the 12 steps, AA gave, readily gave permission just as long as the steps weren't changed and as long as it was said that they were reprinted with permission of AA, which did not mean endorsement by AA of anything around it in the book. So you could have put the 12 steps in the middle of a communist manifesto if you'd wanted to. It just, AA never denied permission to use the 12 steps. And as people discovered the power in the steps, which is really the power of spirituality for other chronic conditions of not only other addictions like narcotics addiction, but other terminal illnesses, um, they adapt, adapted, adopted the steps, and some of them then adapted the steps, and AA was never proprietary. They were proprietary, but I, I have to, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I, I think the story of them losing the copyright is so funny, because in, when I live in Chicago in 1985, I got this phone call from the general office manager saying, Ernie, when you're doing your research, did you see anything about the copyright on the big book? You know, about Bill renewing the copyright, and I, thought, and I said, no, I, I never saw anything about that. And I said, well, you know, why, why do you ask? And he said, well, you know, I'm afraid we've lost the copyright. And I burst out in laughter, and he got, <laughs> he got quite angry, and he said, I don't see what's so funny. And I said, how typical of a bunch of drunks, what would you expect? <laughs> you know, they got this big book, which is so wonderful, and, you know, it, it, uh, 
the first 164 pages, therefore, the first edition are in the public domain. And, you know, they were worried that, you know, other people would, you know, who's the market for copies of the big book? Our members of Alcoholics Anonymous, they're going to keep purchasing it from Alcoholics Anonymous. They're going to worry about other people publishing the big book and cutting, because they rely on the sales for income right. to support the activities of the general service office. And so it didn't seem like a big thing to, I saw immediately, but they were, it just, I just think it's such a funny story that they, they were so concerned with helping other alcoholics, they just didn't bother with little triviality of renewing copyright, which you had to do in those days. You yeah. wouldn't have to do these days. But uh, I think it's marvelous, though, because it does put those first 164 pages in public domain. And uh, I think people have, by see, therefore, they can see them online now with the addition right. of this technology. And uh, It's really so, left the program open to be adapted you yes. know, for just an unending list of other addictions and problems. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and, and, then, and then more recently, too, we've had the emergence of explicitly religious and explicitly secular yes. frameworks yes. of recovery that you've also cataloged in, in some of the work with Faces and Voices. Right. Which is anonymous and groups such as this, which yeah. are very explicitly religious and very explicitly Christian. Mm -hmm. uh, it's interesting, JAX, the group for Jewish, alcoholics, chemical dependent people, and it's uh, significant others, marvelous acronym. Uh, they do not provide special meetings. They, they encourage people to go to AA, but they will point people to meetings that are not extremely explicitly Christian. And then there are the right. totally secular groups that have split off, such as Life Ring Anonymous, uh, a secular organization for sobriety, which uh, many people who have difficulty with the spiritual. There's this problem right now with people in incarcerated populations and as AA a religion in some circuits of the, in the American court system mm -hmm. has interpreted AA practice to mean it's a religion and therefore there's a difficulty with giving a coerced population access and so these other options are just fine. There are right. programs that are secular that can be brought in and uh, as far as I know, I've never met an AA member who objects to these things. Right. It's always, if that keeps them sober, good for them. You know, the mutual aid guide that you have at Faces and Voices, I mean, the sheer volume of, of the varieties reflected in those groups. What do, you, what do you think the implications of that are for counselors today, addiction counselors in particular? Well, the first implication is, I'm sure there are many groups I'm not reaching to that list. I mean, the explosion is such, and yeah. people will write me and tell me about groups. Some of the groups are very limited, like like Mothers Off Meth, and uh, sort of confined to the state of Iowa, but where crystal meth was recently a large problem. But uh, we we link to them because they there might be other people with mm -hmm. these problems, and they're very generous with their material. I think this. I think counselors need to realize that there is no one answer. People come in infant variety. That's why there's a number of people that we have, and uh, uh, no one thing is going to fit everyone, and you can't constrain people into a cookie cutter or into a mold, which, by the way, is one of the things mm -hmm. that supposedly was in handwriting the, that manuscript of the big book. Bill always said you can't put people in a mold. Yeah. Uh, and so the recognition of variety, I think, is the important thing here. Yeah, yeah. And being able, being able to refer people to these groups. The other thing is that uh, I think in referral, referral has to be to a person. You can't, you, when you refer people to AA, you don't say go to an AA meeting. That's not a referral. You don't even take out a book and say, well, there's a meeting at Third Presbyterian Church on Thursday nights. Why don't you go to it? That's not a referral. A referral is you find someone who has the kind of sobriety, the kind of lifestyle you want your client to have, and you introduce two human beings, one to another. And if it gets known within the AA community that you do this kind of thing, you're, you're going to say, where do I find people like this? Mm -hmm. Start looking. They'll turn up. Mm -hmm. uh, because there's this, again, there's this variety. The, the danger is even within AA, uh, somebody goes to a meeting and comes back and says, well, I tried AA. Well, because there is this variety. No, you didn't. <laughs> There used to be the old thing, 90 meetings in 90 days, and some people thought, well, that's really to saturate them with AA. No, the idea was to make sure that they saw a variety of meetings. Right. Groups don't meet every day of the week. Some do, of course. Right. But in general, if you're going to go to 90 meetings in 90 days, you're probably going to hit about at least 15 groups. And you're going to get a sense that you're going to find a group that's comfortable. Mm -hmm. And I think the first thing is that a professional, you refer to someone who's got, again, that quality, they'll take them to those meetings. 
And then they'll take them to other meetings where they think they'll feel at home. This being able to feel at home is so important. Mm -hmm. And I think one trap profession, referring to AA is different than referring to a professional. Yeah. Uh, professional, you know, the competence, and, and you, even when you refer to a professional, there are certain professionals you wouldn't refer to. Right. And you don't know enough about AA, you see, you know, that there's certain AA meetings you might not fit your particular client. So yeah. I think that referral to a person and recognizing if anybody comes in and says, well, I tried AA, you know, how many meetings did you go to? How many different meetings did you go to? And if the answer is less than 30, you send them out again. Yeah. Ernie, let me, let me transition, if we can, from the, the, the concentrated work on not God and the work that's followed that to the work on spirituality. Mm. I'm very interested in how the work on that led to spirituality of imperfection perfection began? Again, it's one of those AA coincidences, I think. Uh, I was interested, I was looking at the steps, and especially with the burgeoning of therapy in the late, mid to late 1980s, uh, the spirituality that was conveyed by the steps, it struck me, was, was the significant thing. And because I had some background theology, I had spent years in the seminary and then was a teaching fellow at Harvard Divinity School as a, sort of a sport during the, mm -hmm. while I was there, because one of my mentors was on the faculty there. Um, I, I was interested in developing this, this thought, this line of thought. And I mentioned this to Father Jim Royce, a Jesuit priest who started the first college level alcohol studies program at Seattle University. And- one of uh, the grand figures in our- Yeah, one of the, yes. okay, that, with yeah. ethics, especially yes. with Dr. Yes. Bissell. And, uh, Anyway, so he knew I was interested in this, and I chatted with him. I mean, if you're going to write about spirituality, you better talk to a Jesuit priest someplace <laughs> along the line. And, and so he knew this, and uh, this woman who lived in Walla Walla, Washington, of all places, Kathy Ketchum, had been Jim Milam's co-author in the book Under the Influence. Oh, yes. And Kathy sort of had the same sense coming out of that that what, what that book lacked was something about spirituality. She didn't know a lot about it, but had that sense from the people she met. And so she, hearing that Father Royce, and of course Jesuit priest, he must know about spirituality, she called him and asked him would you know, he care to work with her in, on a project like this. And Jim said, no, but I think I know somebody I should call. And Kathy called me. And, you know, has this raised this possibility as a professional co-author, a skilled writer, uh, contact with an agent? And uh, so I, I was doing a lot of presenting at that time, and I had some connections with the Veterans Administration. There's a VA hospital in Walla Walla, and I pulled a few strings, and the VA invited me to give a presentation to the VA hospital <laughs> in, Walla Walla. in Walla Walla for their staff and, and lied people. And Kathy came along, and I gave this... I always give things orally before I write them. I'm a speaker before I am a writer, which is one reason I've published so little probably, uh, especially since I've been off the road. But uh, Kathy sat in the back scribbling furiously all during the, the workshop that I was giving. And at the end, she said, I, you know, I think we've got to go. And I stayed and I, for either two or three more days, I forget. And, I was in a hotel and she came and she just spent the whole, she spent about 16 hours of the day with me. I thought, her husband was so marvelously tolerant, I thought so <laughs> trusting. And we just, we just, you know, we hammered out an outline, decided what we were going to do. And I went back to, uh, I was living in Oxford, Michigan at the time. Mm -hmm. And she went back to her home in Walla Walla. And uh, we started exchanging manuscripts. This was the days really before email. Uh, and so while we wrote on computers, and that guy was written on a typewriter, by the way. Yeah. Some people they don't realize how old I am. We, we sent, we'd mail back and forth using all the Air Express agencies. And uh, I can be difficult to work with. I just asked Kathy. I think I only had to send her flowers four times during our, our relationship. Where <laughs> I realized that I had, had said something hurtful to her. Um, but we, she is very thick-skinned. And we hammered out the book that became The Spirituality of Imperfection, which amazingly, it was published first in 1992. And there were six books published that year on spirituality. And because the uh, editor at Bantam who had purchased our book left Bantam at just that time to go to, there was, our book received no publicity, no, not one advertisement. And you know, these other books came out with large names attached to them. And uh, what do you do? 
I mean, this is you play the hand you're dealt. And, uh, but you know, I'm fascinated so because... So it that caught on. It's the only book published in 1992, though. It's still in print. I mean, if you go to Amazon, it still will rank sometimes around the, between 2,000 and 3,000 in sales on a given day, which is... That book tapped such a nerve in the culture, and I'm wondering if you have any sense of what it was that that, that book, you know, sort of tapped in terms of the res incredibly broad response to that book. It seemed to really meet a kind of unique need for this culture at that, at that time and continues to do so. I think there are two things, and it's exactly like AA. First of all, the book is a book of stories. There are 99 stories in that book. It's not a book of exposition. Uh, I had especially a lot of rabbinic stories. Many people think that I'm Jewish. I'm, I'm Catholic if anyone's interested. Um, but I, I had experience with rabbi friends who told me stories way back, and, and these stories lingered in your memory. And I went out and sought them in the, the, my memory. I verified by looking them up in places. And uh, so I think this, the fact that the stories, uh, rather than the book being just expository, uh, that the Whatever it had to say was mainly conveyed by stories, I think, is the first, mm -hmm. which again, this is AA, which you yeah. learn from AA. Yeah. And then the second is, I think the book um, did convey spirituality. I think there is, if you will pardon the metaphor, a thirst for spirituality mm -hmm. in the culture. And yet, spirituality comes so often packaged in unattractive ways, uh, you know, the overt, aggressive, uh, mm -hmm extreme, one extreme or the other, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. just turns off people. And this, I, I think to, to the extent, again, following the example of AA and avoiding things that were extraneous, listen, the themes of that book came from what I got by listening at meetings. Mm -hmm. And that basically, uh, I kept going to AA and kept listening at meetings. For one thing, I found it tremendously personally enriching, my own life. But, uh, I also I study, I cannot not study something, is what it amounts to. And I started hearing these themes, and, 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 and so I, I took those themes and wrote about those themes. The interesting thing is, you know, 1992, 2007, I've kept going to meetings. And I would revise those themes at this point. I'm not could, sure. Could we talk some about those themes and, and elaborate on some of those and how, how your view of those have changed over time? Well, the key, yeah, that, that sort of, uh, you know, what is spirituality? How do you recognize spirituality? Spirituality cannot be defined. It has to be experienced. And you know, one of the stories, the, one of the, the, the masters, uh, you know, the students saying, you know, can, can you, if you cannot explain it, it, it is not real. And the master saying, you know, do you know the smell of a rose? Explain it. <laughs> uh, you know, this, there, are, there are things we cannot explain and spirituality is one of them. So they, we see them in certain qualities and experiences and one is the sense of release, the sense of being freed, which usually only comes by letting go of something, by freeing something. Mm -hmm. and I think this is so clear, especially in alcoholism, the, the admission of powerlessness is the letting go of the need to be in control, from which comes this tremendous sense of freedom. And if, again, if you listen to the stories told by these people who are glowing with sobriety, there is this it. release. There's this sense, this twofold thing. I have been freed. Mm -hmm. you know, alcohol is a savage master for those addicted to it, any substance. Mm -hmm. And the sense of being freed from that, that cunning, baffling, mm -hmm. powerful master, uh, which, which comes by letting go. Mm -hmm. And the pe most people not necessarily make that connection, but if you listen to their stories, that's yeah. there. Yeah. You know, you, you can't even say which comes first, but you always hear both. There is both an experience of, I have been freed. Not that I've won my freedom, I have mm -hmm. been freed. Mm -hmm. And also the experience of having let go of something that they thought they absolutely needed. Mm -hmm. This is what during the other chronic conditions very often is a very important thing, mm -hmm. even more so than the alcoholic letting go of the, of the alcohol. Mm -hmm. And then I think the second one which flows from that is a sense of gratitude. The problem is the word gratitude is used so often in our culture and gratitude is one of those realities that while you're naming it, you're not experiencing it. 
Gratitude is the recognition of gift. And we have so many occasions for gifts created by the greeting card manufacturers and the candy makers that people have lost the sense of gift. A gift is something freely and spontaneously given and recognizing that one has received a gift. That's gratitude. Freely and spontaneously given. If I give my wife a diamond necklace for our anniversary, this is marvelous, and I'm sure she'd be very happy. In fact, I'm sure she'd wonder where I stole it. But you know, <laughs> but if if I stop, I'm on my way home from shopping, and there's someone selling roses on the corner, and I, I buy a bunch of roses and bring them home and say, you know, here, these are because I love you. That's the that's gift. far more meaningful to her. In, yeah. in, if you can. I mean, it's it's a, a gift is something freely and spontaneously given, and those who achieve sobriety, it's a gift. I mean, they've tried so hard, they've struggled so hard, that in this release, then they recognize gift. Mm -hmm. Gratitude is the ability, then we recognize the gifts others give us. Mm -hmm. That we, we are so gifted. Mm -hmm. And in the sense of entitlement with which we're, and in the sense of occasioning things, you know, this control thing that we, we lose the sense of gift. And one of the great gifts of this spirituality is to again become capable of recognizing gift. Mm -hmm. And I, I just think that that's, uh, these things become almost ineffable because they are spiritual. Mm -hmm. Humility, the, the giving up of the sense of being special or exceptional. I mean, the alcoholic you know, is the center of his or her own uni universe. You know, selfishness, self-centeredness, that we think is the root of our problems. Harry Tebow's diagnosis of the alcoholic is his majesty, the baby. Right. Uh, this, uh, and humility is a giving up of this sense of, but I'm different. The sense of exceptionality. I'm unique. And this, what this allows is a rejoining of the human race. At the end of one of the discussion of the steps in the 12 and 12, rejoining the human race. And so this is where one becomes capable of fitting in, belonging to a group in the sense of needing the group. This, mm -hmm. this is all related to humility. Humility is not, you know, obeisance or getting down in the mud or mm -hmm. humility is this recognition of there's nothing special, especially. I'm not, I'm not different. And, and I can fit in, therefore, I belong. Mm -hmm. The alcoholic never is at home. You've talked about this magic, almost, of, of both choosing and being chosen in terms yeah. of this connection yeah, with people that's, to community that's so beautiful. That, that's exactly what goes on here, this, this becoming, this, this letting go of this, but I'm different, this, mm -hmm. this classic first words of the, but I'm different, mm -hmm. and this giving up that and, oh, uh, Becoming able to fit in, you know, uh, going to a meeting and have your hand shaking, you can't even hold the coffee cup, and you realize that the person who gave you the coffee cup only half filled it because they knew that your hand would be shaking, <laughs> and you start figuring, maybe I'm in the right place. place. <laughs> These people know what's going on, or however that happens in the, when they at first, no one ever feels at home at their first AA meeting. And yet one of the great things that happens when alcoholics travel and you know, they, they're looking for an AA meeting and they, when they finally find the room, let's say, <sighs> this, this uh, sense of being at home, sense of community that comes mm -hmm. from, the salt I see related to, I didn't relate this humility as much in, mm -hmm. in the Spirituality of Imperfection book, but I'm seeing that differently now. And the ones that I would add, I think, to the, the, the ones that I discussed there or at least arrange differently Honesty and openness, honesty in the sense of letting the significant others in our lives know us as we really are. Mm -hmm. This doesn't mean going on TV and telling everybody everything about us. It's not honesty. Uh, this, this honesty, however, is letting the significant others know us as we are, realizing that it's not so much our fear of being found out. That's real. There'll always be that fear of being found out, but with that comes the need to be found. Mm -hmm. And as I discuss more when I, when I do shame, we all have the need at some point to say, here I am, and to have somebody respond with, thank God, and embrace. Just this, you know, not, uh, uh, I'm glad you're here. And that the reason there for the honesty, honesty, 
if one is honest with the significant others, one, one finds that you know, the fears are unfounded, one is accepted, one is forgiven, and it's being forgiven that we have the capacity to forgiveness. This is something else. They say mm -hmm. forgive, and I have trouble with a lot of the forgiveness literature because it does not realize, recognize that we really, it seems incapable, we are incapable of forgiving unless we have the experience of being forgiven. Mm -hmm. This, for many people, for over a millennium, was the basic truth of Christianity as they looked upon the image of a crucified uh, Jesus of Nazareth. The idea of you, know, you have been forgiven is, is the message, the message of salvation, to put it in theological vocabulary, but the, you, know, you have been accepted, you've been, okay, well, in interpersonal relationships, I have some stories in the spiritual aid and perfection that still hold. You know, we, 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 we fess up to someone about something and we discover that we have been forgiven, which makes us capable of forgiving. And this flows over then into, there's the discovery of meaning in one's life when one becomes of service to others. This is one, again, one of the characteristics, the 12 step, carrying the message not only to other alcoholics, yes, but finding ways to be of service. Mm -hmm. Because now there's a sense of meaning in one's life. I have something to give. You know, my life has purpose. There's, mm -hmm. I have something to give and I, I need to give it. It's right in my being. And so the combination of those, uh, you know, now five as I've enumerated yeah. them in this revised version, qualities, you cannot define spirituality, but if you, if you watch people who are recognized as spiritual, whom you recognize as spiritual, again, one of, a key phrase in the big book, if you have decided you want what we have. Yeah. And so if you know, these people, uh, whether it be the Dalai Lama or the Pope or, or some nun in a hospital or some mm -hmm. physician who is extremely caring or you know, some counselor who always is, is always there just uh, to, to the recognition of the reality of these they have these qualities why are they like the way they are how do you get to if you get to know their stories these themes mm -hmm. seem to be there and in terms of those themes and those qualities I'm thinking you referenced earlier in our discussions that you don't have to be an alcoholic to help an alcoholic we've sort of shed part of that old belief but, and also recognition that, that not all alcoholics are effective helping other alcoholics. Exactly. Right. So, right. so if we have this, if we focus on those who are helpful, what are some of the core things that are, that are shared by those, those people that do offer that kind of help, regardless of recovery status? Well, it's uh, not only with, uh, alcoholism is not contagious, but recovery is. And recovery, uh, in many ways, recovering our humanities, we're talking about not recovering from a particular disorder or disease. And I think this comes about, we, we did touch on it before, you know, this coming, touching the bottom, the zero, the hole in the middle of oneself. Recognizing oneself as, as finite, limited, one who makes mistakes, one who does things that are bad, and just that that's there, and I, but I, that's not all of me. And so being in touch with, with that whole that's at the core of our being, being in touch, that, that's again what Sister Ignatia had. With, mm -hmm. uh, that's why these biographies are so important. They illuminate those things, especially in the lives of that. I think in order to be effective, you have to have, touch, have touched it and have remained in contact with it. It's not something that you touch once and it's, you've had it. You know, what I've drawn from those biographies is there's a, this striking lack of contempt you know, exactly. and judgment, Respect. and this, this emotional authenticity right. Right. without, even without the, re, the addiction recovery experience, but they bring this genuineness and acceptance. Yeah, lack of contempt, you capture it perfectly in that, in that, uh, that phrase, in that term, because contempt is the thing that we just react negatively to, and yet contempt is something that could sneak in so readily if we're not, you know, trying to be conscious of, of spirituality, whatever we call it. We're not even magic about the word spirituality, by the way. It's, it's useful, currently it's the useful vocabulary, it mm -hmm. seems. For some, maybe it's not. But there's, the, you know, this is the quality that these, there's, you know, having, having touched that whole, you, you understand other people's holes. Mm -hmm. Or maybe if not understand them, you at least recognize them. And you cannot, 
when that identi that is identification that takes place. I think for real curing to take place on this level, there has to be an identification. Mm -hmm. Surgeons or physicians do not have to suffer the same disability as those they heal. That's a different kind of healing. But the kind of healing that takes place on this, on this plane of uh, things that touch on the spiritual, I think an identification is absolutely necessary. I'm fascinated, and I know the vocabulary of transference and countertransference. Mm -hmm. I think various modalities of, of therapy have approached this in one way or another. But I think it goes back to that basic spiritual, if you want, you've decided you want what we have. Jesus of Nazareth saying, come follow me. This is what all of the, you know, how, you know, tell me what to do. I mean, there's this marvelous story of a young man who approaches Jesus in the middle of the night and say, you know, tell, how, you, know, I can, you know, tell me what to do. And Jesus says, come follow me. No, damn it, tell me what to, you know, and this, <laughs> we all have this. And this, uh, it's this quality. We want to follow these people. Yeah. And now not everybody, this is it, because we are limited beings, I mean, there are very few Dalai Lamas or Jesus of Nazareth uh, that everybody wants to follow. I mean, you may have a very vibrant spirituality and some people will not s see it. Ernie, what do, you th what do you think are some of the implications or things most important for addiction counselors and addiction professionals to understand about spirituality and recovery, or maybe even about spirituality and what they do in their roles? Uh, are you trying to trap me? I mean, I maybe. <laughs> yeah, I know enough not to tell members of AA how to get sober. Now you're asking me to tell addiction professionals how to be professionals. I, yeah, I'm a historian. I'm one of those people. I'm one of those doctors that doesn't do anybody any yeah. good. But I know you spend a lot of time training addiction counselors all over the country. And I, what are some of the things they found most striking in some of the work you've done? What are some of the things they've taught me is what you're yeah. asking. Can I yeah. pass it back? Uh, I think the importance of uh, this distinction between therapy and spirituality has to come out on top. Because this is, again, where I see them nodding and what they talk about other elsewhere. Uh, you can't lock them. I mean, it's in some relationships with spirituality, some therapeutic healing takes place, but it, it's not intended. Just as a you know, spirituality, a spiritual relationship, there are healing things that someone could say that's the kind of therapy will take place. I think it's also true that in, the, in therapy, there are certain kinds of uh, a spiritual healing that will take place. You, can, you can't lock it in or out. This, I think, mm -hmm. there are no, no boundaries is the thing. I know there are a lot of boundary issues, and currently boundary issues is a big deal. Well, there can't be a boundary around spirituality. It's very nature. By definition. Just by definition. Yeah. Spirituality is going to sneak in where you don't want it, and where you try to capture it, it ain't going to be there. <laughs> and it's, it's just one of those things, one of those realities. It's like that. And I, I think the recognition on the part of counselors when the, the sensitivity that this identification is taking place, this is where the education in psychology and the education in human relationships, the professional knowledge of how to understand what's going mm -hmm. on inside a person that they cannot put into words, this may be the most important thing in both therapy and spirituality. How, how do you hear what they're not saying? Mm -hmm. This the, the therapeutic third ear is, is, is the, the spiritual listening for the spirit. And you know the metaphors differ, but the same thing is going on. And uh, uh, a, a spiritual director who is aware of therapies can you know have a third ear, and a, a counselor who is aware of spirituality can listen for the spirit. And it's just mm -hmm. you know, use the metaphor that you find helpful. Don't be restricted by your metaphors. Mm -hmm. I'd say, and just recognize that they are distinct, but you cannot keep them separate. You can't confuse them, because if you try to put them together, it gets messed up. Mm -hmm. They're one of those realities that you have to let just happen. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's sort of uh, uh, you know, one of the, the classic example that's used in the literature, you can force sex, you cannot force love. Mm -hmm. There's no such thing as forced love. Mm -hmm. And there's no such thing as forced healing either therapeutic or spiritual. Yeah. But we're in this realm of uh, what goes on is, is the core ad core loquitur was the motto of Cardinal Newman, which, which Bill picked up when he, language of the heart. Mm -hmm. 
yeah. uh, the, the, which was a key expression for him. I think first when he went to an A meeting, conducted in a language he didn't understand, and yet he said, I understood everything there because they were speaking the language of the heart. And that was the title chosen for the book of his collected grapevine writings, yeah. of course. And uh, You know, I'm thinking of the, you used the term earlier, contagiousness in this same context. I, lo I love that, that you, it may not be forced on you, but you may catch it in, in an yeah, inadvertent kind of way. I, I think there's a lot in that. It's, I mean, it's a lot in these little catchy phrases, but some people treat alcoholics as if alcoholism were contagious. I mean, yeah, they did. <laughs> We understand it, please. So the drunk is not very attractive, but alcoholism is not contagious. It may be a disease, but no one has ever claimed it's contagious. So you can get close to so it. Far. So far, probably someone has, but anyway, <laughs> in the literature I know. On the other hand, recovery is contagious. If you are near genuine recovery, it, it spreads. <laughs> And therefore, in all of these different modes of recovery, and this is perhaps where some of these other groups come in. Some, for example, some women go to both Women in Sobriety and Alcoholics Anonymous because they have feminist issues, women's issues tied in with their, with their addiction, whatever it was, that are helping women for sobriety. And there's the, the, their recovery, therefore, is broadened. And this recovery in, in every sphere, recovery, uh, <laughs> Don't tell anybody, but recovery is spirituality. <laughs> it's another word that we like sanctity and sanity and serenity and sobriety. Recovery is a word that doesn't begin with S. That means the same thing as all of those. It, yeah, it, you've it, really pushed the understanding of that, of, of recovery itself. I hope way, so. way beyond simply the elimination of alcohol and drugs from an otherwise unchanged life. Yeah, I hope so. But again, it's not original with me. This is AA. Right. I mean, this, you know, having had a spiritual awakening the last, what does that mean? Right. It, it means there's been a fundamental change in one's being that, you know, I now glow, at least sometimes, mm -hmm. <laughs> not always. <laughs> but uh, they, this, you know, we are, we are these fellible human beings, and sometimes as I talk about this, I feel, my God, I'm romanticized. Everybody's going to think I'm, you know, I'm no. You know, we, I mean, I, I just, again, I love Ernest Becker's image and description of human nature. Man is a god who shits. On the one hand, we have this capacity for altruism and healing and benefit and spirituality. And on the other hand, we are periodically reminded of our ties to the earth. Mm -hmm. We are fallible beings who will die and rot someday. And, you know, there are days that are more rotten than others in this mixed <laughs> being that we have. and recognizing that humility, recognize the mix of this is what sort of allows us to get through them. Mm -hmm. But it's not saying that they're not going to be there. So that, uh, yeah, I think that's central, the recognition that recovery, this is why people, people hate, tell me who your friends are and I'll tell you what kind of person you are. I mean, this, this goes through the wisdom literature of the whole world. This is, besides going to A meetings, I love reading wisdom literature. And you know, yeah. whether it be the Greek dramatist or Shakespeare or Eastern literature, because they all say the same thing in such myriad rich ways. Mm -hmm. I was thinking of your reference to gifts earlier. In term, I was almost thinking for a moment of the spirituality of the counselor themselves. And I was thinking one of the gifts they have is to really sort of participate in this transformation process and actually watch people get better than well. That there are at least some people they will work with, they will, see the, they will have the gift mm -hmm. of seeing people go far beyond simply the removal of this you know, horribly destructive disorder. Yeah, they'll realize that the person has achieved something that they're not responsible for. See, I think this is where the counselor has to let go. Right, and not take ownership the, yeah, of the Yeah, the counselor <laughs> can tend to take, exactly, exactly. Yeah. The counselor has to realize that they don't have ownership of the recovery. And the gift is being able to recognize that you know, something's taking place here that I ain't responsible right. for. It. And boy, it's good. Yeah. That, that, uh, that ability to get outside the narrow bonds of self, which is our daily joy. Right. And for the counselor to get outside the bonds of all the demands placed upon them, get beyond the demands of their theoretical models, you know, that, that, that when they transcend those, there's this opportunity for genuineness as they reach out and connect with people they're working with. You know, if people like you could just free them from half the paperwork they have to do, that would be a good start, by the way, this idea. Start. I think this, 
I, I, when counseling became professionalized, I recognized the needs and the benefits of it, but when I see some of these charismatic healing people laboring over putting something on paper instead of spending time with human beings, I sort of ache. I, I've known some of these counselors and I've you know, met them in diverse places and why are you sitting in this office to eat that you should be with? And I, mm -hmm. I, again, it's my little refusal of reality that mm -hmm. I guess I allow it frustrates me and I think that, you know, uh, there, I would hope that supervisory just staff you, would recognize that. Is there a sense that with all the professionalization and the industrialization of treatment, that some dimensions may have got lost in that process? I mean, that, and I'm almost talking about that capacity to free that person's time to do that work. I know you know more about that to speak to whether, I, I mean, some things are lost, some things are gained over time. This is just inevitable with the process right. of time. I do think, though, that the, the multiplication of paperwork of uh, Sometimes, again, the, these accrediting agencies that's getting tied into the uh, mandates of insurance companies or third-party payers. And then, you know, on one level, it's necessary because that's how the system works. On the other hand, it actually is getting in the way of healing because people who could be healing are spending half their time filling out forms. Yeah. And I don't have an easy solution to it. Um, it's easy to jump on the insurance industry or this or that. I, I the, Clearly to prevent abuses, some of these things are necessary. I just, it, it, it hurts though when, I would hope supervisory personnel, you know, would, would try to find, would see as a primary responsibility to see ways that especially their most curious, their the most recovered counselor, mm -hmm. staff members have a chance to do more people stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I, I mean, I, it's, I don't want to two tears, I don't know how. If I had an easy answer, I'd publish it, get rich. <laughs> I have no easy answer.